Okay, can you guys see that full screen? Sure. Perfect. Got it. Perfect. Okay, so tonight talk is going to be um, an, uh, an introductory talk on getting started in astrophotography. And uh, it's, it's going to start out very, very basic. And then um, we're going to have subsequent presentations in uh, follow-up meetings and follow-up monthly get-togethers that will go into more depth. So um, tonight what we're going to talk about is, um, you know, the fact that astrophotography can be very intimidating. It's something that I know as a member of the club for um, 25 years or so, um, I've heard a lot of people say, I'd like to do that, but I'm not quite sure how to get started. And um, even... Oh, even you know who that is, Mamie? I'm sorry. What? Uh, never mind. Anyway, so um, we've all had that feeling. No matter how advanced you are in astrophotography, um, at some point you felt, oh man, this is, this is fairly deep. This is something that... Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting it over my head. And even as you progress, even as you learn, that feeling comes back at various times. So tonight we're gonna to try to kind of get you past that, um, that point and sort of break the ice. And um, by starting out simple and then pushing further as your skills and your confidence progress, um, you can have a lot of fun photographing astronomical objects, events, atmospheric phenomenon using readily available equipment. Um, obviously you can go very, very deep into this and as, and as deep as you, as you want. And one thing that I can't emphasize enough is that experiment. There are rules and there are different things we're gonna talk about, but experiment, experimentation is really a key part of uh, learning. And it's also uh, a key part of advancing yourself and of increasing your confidence. And um, nowadays with digital cameras, that old saying, you know, film is, film is cheap. Well, uh, digital film is effectively free except for the time that you spend working with it. So we're gonna start out just by talking about um, using a handheld point and shoot camera, DSLR, a phone, and then um, show examples of various pictures that Tom and I took using that technique. Then we're gonna go up a step and use a camera and a fixed tripod. So no, no tracking mounts. We're not gonna cover any kind of um, equatorial tracking tonight. Um, we're gonna follow up next month with that, uh, with a presentation that um, Joe will be leading off. So uh, we're gonna look at some accessories that make fixed tripod photography uh, more successful, such as a cable release or a camera self timer. And then we're gonna add a, um, uh, another accessory called an intervalometer to that mix to allow you to uh, expand the type of picture you can take. So let's start off first with just using um, a camera in your, in your hand. So um, this is a picture that um, I, I took a long time ago. This is, um, Oh, probably at least uh, 2008 or 2009, of uh, just um, the moon, the full moon, hand handheld. And um, one of the things to keep in mind that handheld photography is limited to bright objects or things like atmospheric phenomena, like cloud formations or solar halos, uh, rainbows, things of that sort, which are not technically astrophotos, but they're related because they're caused by, um, you know, uh, things in the atmosphere, say that, and, and, you know, the sun reflecting off rain particles and so forth and so on. For most of these photographs, you can use just auto exposure and, and uh, auto focus. Uh, that's fairly typical. Um, but you might want to keep in mind that manual control of your camera, if, if you're not familiar with that, it's a good thing to get familiar with in terms of, um, some of the follow-up stuff with the fixed tripod uh, shooting. Another recommendation would be to um, set your camera to shoot in both RAW plus JPEG. That'll give you the most flexibility as you advance because the RAW images will be um, basically stored as uh, linear uh, without compression and will allow you to, uh, to do 
techniques that we're going to be talking about in future workshops, such as uh, stretching those images, uh, stacking, things of that sort. Um, I, I tend to shoot in both because I like the preview in uh, JPEG when I'm just thumbing through them. Uh, the raw files tend to be bigger and they tend to take a little longer to load on your computer when you're previewing them. So I tend to shoot both all the time. You can pick one or the other, but both doesn't cost you a whole lot more in space since JPEGs tend to compress uh, fairly readily. Um, here's a picture of the daytime moon. Um, this I, it's always a favorite subject of mine. I, I, I love seeing that blue kind of U from the uh, sky on the moon during, during the day. Um, one thing you need to keep in mind that when you're hand holding, you want to use as fast a shutter speed as possible to avoid blurry images, especially at long focal lengths. Um, there was an old rule of thumb when I was doing film photography many uh, decades ago when I was a kid that, you know, you basically shot with, at the um, shutter speed equivalent to your um, focal length. It was just really one over your uh, focal length. And this would be for, say, like 35 millimeter film format. So, for instance, if you had a 500 millimeter lens, you'd shoot at one five hundredth of a second. If you had a, one, a 125 millimeter lens, you'd shoot at one one twenty fifth of a second. So, um, or one, one, you know, one over 125, I should say it more like that. So um, rules of thumb, though, are meant to be broken, as most people know. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of modern telephoto lenses have built-in image stabilization. So here's, here's an, uh, an example of a shot that's 400 millimeters, but it's with a crop sensor on my um, Canon 70D has a crop sensor. And that means that whatever the focal length of the lens is for Canon, you multiply that by 1.6 to get the effective focal length. For Nikons, it's 1.5. Um, so this is a, an equivalent of 640 millimeter focal length, but you notice it's shot at 1 250th of a second. So that breaks the rule of thumb. It should be 1 1 640th of a second. But because of the image stabilization, I'm getting the equivalent of two or three extra stops, which is in time, it would be one, one quarter. So it, it, it allows me to shoot in one quarter the um, shutter speed or say two to four times faster. Um, here's another one where that, that rule is broken. Um, this was shot in the, in the haze. There was, there was a real thin haze that night and it gave the moon just this really beautiful color. And um, uh, that can be used to add visual interest to your, to your photographs. So don't be discouraged by thin haze, even, even clouds. I'm going to show you an example in the next couple slides of um, one shot through, through some reasonably thick clouds, or I should say thin, thin clouds, but they were very noticeable, not real thin haze like this. Uh, this one was shot at 1 125th of, of a second. Now, that seems like it's getting a little far out there, but um, as you practice and as you uh, get more familiar with your camera, um, you can hand hold fairly uh, slow shutter speeds if you're careful about your technique in terms of pressing a camera, breathing in, your foot, your foot stance, keeping your foot stance wide. A lot of times uh, I'll lean against my wife or I'll lean against the car or I'll lean against something that's near me you know, put your back to that and then put that camera right up to your, to your face. So you're, you're kind of creating your body and the object that you're leaning against is one uh, sort of rigid assembly. And then, you know, just slowly press that shutter. Take, take multiple shots, film is cheap, right? A digital film is cheap. So take multiple shots, bracket them if you're shooting in manual mode, you know, shoot one, one stop, two stops, plus or minus, and then, you go back later on in your computer to pick the best image. Some will be blurry, others won't, hopefully. Um, this is a shot of um, uh, the moon, Venus, and, um, and this sundial at, at Kitt Peak. The point here is to add a foreground object sometimes can create a lot of visual interest. Uh, this was, in fact, Joe Lamb, you, you would remember this, this trip well, I'm, I'm sure, as, as to uh, others who were on this. Paul that went out to um, Arizona as an EVAA group. 
Um, this was uh, following the rules. This was shot at 1 45th of a second, so roughly one over the um, focal length of the lens. This was a crop sensor, so it's a, a almost um, approximately a 50 millimeter lens. But adding foreground objects can create a lot of visual interest. Here's one uh, I shot last week while I was hiking down in um, Tucson of the uh, first quarter moon rising over the um, mountains. This is in um, uh, a canyon called Pima Canyon. And it just happened to catch my eye, the moon coming up. And, you know, I was standing there and it was just a perfect opportunity um, for an astrophoto with some foreground subject material. This is a shot that Barry Johnson contributed that is of um, a solar halo. Uh, so this would be more an example of more of an atmospheric phenomenon. Um, these are uh, very common. You, you can get uh, sun, sun dogs on, on the outside of the, um, of, you know, sometimes it's not a full halo. You'll just pick up the sun dog. Sometimes you'll get repeats of those sun, sun dogs. And then um, this is the sun reflecting through uh, thin ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. And, and Barry's um, uh, a skilled photographer. You notice he put the sun behind the peak of the house so that the picture doesn't get all washed out and just um, uh, too much dynamic range for the camera to have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's one contributed by Harry Orland. This is called the Belt of Venus. Uh, this is another atmospheric phenomenon. So this is um, right after sunset where the sun is just slightly below the horizon. And that, that, that dark band along here is actually the shadow of the earth onto the sky. And then you can see the gradient going into what would be, you know, still a, a bright sky, uh, a relatively bright sky up top. And then you get this pink layer and then you get this this grayish blue layer, which is the um, a shadow of the earth projecting onto the sky. This was taken handheld with an iPhone in the uh, auto mode. So very beautiful photograph, very nice composition. Harry has, you know, um, a very good eye for composition. So, so build that into your um, images if you're doing stuff like that. Um, this was one taken years ago on another uh, DVAA trip. We went out to Alcon at Bryce Canyon and uh, because we had volunteered for doing some public outreach out there, they gave us access to Rainbow's Landing. Uh, so we were out at Rainbow Landing until about 4, 4.30 in the morning. And this was at um, right after sunset. We were standing there just kind of hanging out talking. And I happened to notice the Belt of Venus there. And then lastly, this was shot last week. This is another shot of the Belt of Venus. One of the things I want to point out is that you notice how the um, sky, the upper part of the sky is so different. This was shot out in Tucson last week, um, and I'm in, I'm in the desert, so the, um, it, with the dry atmosphere there, and, uh, and the fact that, you know, there is so, such little moisture in the air, the, the sky is always that really deep blue. So it goes sort of from the, the gray to the pink back to a blue. If you contrast that with Harry's photo, where it's shot in Florida, where there's a lot of humidity, you, you have more of that, you know, summer haze up in the top. And it gives you a whole different feel to that picture. His is a lot brighter picture. And here's a more somber picture with that gray to pink to blue. Um, this was just a, a really interesting cloud formation. My wife and I were coming home on a bicycle ride. And I, I happened to look over at this um, horse field near this farm where we live, and these, these you know, really incredible uh, thick clouds hugging the horizon. So um, I grabbed my phone and we took a picture and then headed home. And then lastly, in this, or not, not lastly, but in terms of cloud formation, this is, uh, we were coming back from a walk and, and um, there was just a beautiful sunset reflecting on these clouds. And I just, I like the way it created this sort of V-shape framed by those trees in the neighborhood. And we mentioned rainbows in the Harry's picture. You know, even something like um, uh, a, a rainbow after a storm or just, um, you know, one that occurs with some moisture in the air. 
uh, here's the double rainbow here. And this one had happened to be particularly vivid that day because it was against, it was framed against these dark clouds in the background. Again, these are all handheld shots and um, very, very simple to, to do. The next thing, the next section we're going to talk about using a fixed tripod. As you noticed in that previous section, you're fairly limited to your subject material with handheld. So simply adding a tripod um, can really expand the range of material of uh, subjects you can photograph by allowing you to increase the shutter time. And, and like before, I mentioned using auto exposure. While that can be used for some subject material, you're going to find very quickly that shooting in a manual exposure mode will give you a lot more control, a lot more flexibility in your photographs, particularly when you're bracketing or if you need to take multiple photographs to do, say, like a high dynamic range uh, composition or a composite photo. And again, as a reminder, you know, it's, it's just storage space is relatively inexpensive nowadays, raw plus JPEG. So what are problems that can come up use, when using a fixed tripod? So one of the most common is camera sleep. You're gonna press the shutter. And you, by definition now, we, 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 since we're using a tripod, we're likely to have a longer exposure time. Well, that means that shutter is open for a longer amount of time. So if there's any shake in the camera, the image is gonna pick that up. Um, the other thing is vibrations caused by the tripod itself. As you touch that uh, camera, that vibration, that, that tripod has a certain resonance and it's going to um, vibrate. And it's commonly uh, referred to as that the uh, tripod is ringing. And that's just that resonance of that tripod. The other, th the other uh, common problem is that you can get motion blurry. So this is really caused by relative movement of the subject material to the camera due to the rotation of the earth. Again, we're shooting longer shutter speeds now. And uh, in general, that'll get worse as the shutter, shutter speed um, um, decreases, meaning slower, and as the focal length of your lens increases. So those are both contributors to uh, motion blur. But fortunately, it's a very easy solution to both of those problems. So as far as um, camera shake, a good way to mitigate that is to use um, a cable release. And um, a cable release allows you to press a button, as most people know, separate from the camera. And then it'll um, nowadays electronically trigger the camera. In the past, it used to uh, mechanically press the shutter button. <clears throat> That's a very simple way to reduce camera shape. And, and also really convenient, because you can still take the picture exactly when you want to take it. An alternate technique is if you don't have a cable release is to use a self timer mode in your camera. Just like if you were to take a picture where you wanted to be in the picture, you set up the camera and then you set it for 10 seconds and you go run over and get in the picture. Well, that's a great way to, um, to, to uh, reduce shake if you don't have a cable release. You can set it to two seconds, 10 seconds or the standard defaults. So a lot of cameras nowadays have a custom mode, you can, you can set it to whatever you want. If you have a real heavy duty tripod, a couple seconds is enough. If you're using just an average tripod or light duty, they can ring for quite a while. They can ring for five, seven, seven seconds. You, you'd be safer to go with a 10 second setting. And, and as, a, as, as a, um, a sort of lead in, this is what I'm talking about here. So from a vibration standpoint, um, it can be significant. You can test your setup uh, by um, either, you know, putting it on live view if your camera has live view mode and touch, touch the camera. You don't have to take a picture. Just touch it and let it go. And you can see that image shape. If you have a telephoto lens, dial up the telephoto lens to a, to a long focal length, and you'll see that shape even more so. That'll give you a better representation of that shape. Um, a heavier duty tripod helps reduce the um, you know uh, length of the ringing. And the other thing is to use vibration uh, suppression pads. These are commonly used for 
visual observing, but they're very, very handy for um, uh, photographing also. And, and uh, as, as an example of that, um, there are some world-class um, uh, planetary imagers, uh, Chris, Chris Go, uh, Damian Peach, people like that. That's part of their standard setup when they're using, say, like a C-14 uh, with a planetary camera. They still use vibration suppression pads, even though they have a very heavy mount, a, a very heavy scope. You would think, well, that thing's not going to vibrate. But what in, in the, some lectures that I've heard from them, they talk about these micro vibrations. So even for advanced uh, astrophotographers, vibration suppression pads can still uh, can, can really be a benefit. Um, so then we get now down to relative motion. So motion blurring is something that is uh, happens because you're shooting at a longer shutter speed and the planet's moving. We're, we're sitting on a planet that's spinning around like a top. So um, there used to be an old, uh, an old rule. Um, and and I, I say it's a rule of 500-ish because in the past, a long, long time ago, it used to be 700. Some people used 400. And then it kind of got, for ease of math and stuff, it got further to 500. Um, and, and that's because, like, if you had, say, like a 50 millimeter lens, then you're going to shoot at, say, maximum of 10 seconds. This is 35 millimeter equivalent again. Um, so it's very easy to determine a, a recommended shutter speed using this rule of 500. All you do is you divide the effective focal length of the lens you're using into 500. And I mentioned again the effective focal length. So if you're shooting a full frame sensor, or 35 millimeter film, then your focal length of your lens is your effective focal length. So if you have a 100 millimeter lens, you divide that into 500, you're gonna get a five second exposure. This is typically the max you would wanna use before you started to see noticeable star trails. There will be star trails there unless you're tracking. The key is that will they be noticeable or not at that focal length? in terms of the field of view that you're shooting. So um, some examples here for 50 millimeter, as I mentioned, that's 10, 10 seconds, 100 millimeter, five. If you go up to 400 millimeters, you're shooting one and a quarter seconds. And that's why um, at some point you do want to introduce tracking because you're going to want to get a closer, uh, you, 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 I shouldn't say you're going to want to, you might want to get a closer uh, view of your subject, and then you're going to have to push the full length. Um, there's one last thing to consider, too, and that's where you're pointing the camera. As you notice from this star trail picture, this is an eight-second exposure shot at 16, uh, it's eight, eight seconds, I meant to say eight-minute exposure shot at a very wide field. This is a 16-millimeter equivalent lens. Um, and I, I did this just for an example, if you notice at Polaris, somewhere in, in this area, um, that uh, the stars look like pinpoints. They're, they're hardly moving at all, even at eight minutes. But as you go further away, this is the Big Dipper here. As you go further away, you can see there are noticeable star trails. So the uh, declination of where you're pointing the camera matters too. But generally speaking, if you use that 500-ish rule, if you're shooting more towards the celestial equator, maybe it's a rule of 300. If you're shooting closer to the pole, maybe it's a rule of 700. So use your judgment, take multiple exposures, um, experiment. So, um, sorry, I think I... Uh, Oh, I duped the slide and forgot to drop it out. <clears throat> so um, here's a table that just gives you um, a quick summary from 14 millimeter to, two, to 200 millimeter. This is the lens focal length. Uh, if you're a full frame camera, here's your exposure times. If you're a Nikon 1.5 crop, here's your exposure times. If you're a Canon 1.6 crop, here are your exposure times. 
And now here's the link from where I got that. Um, now, as with any rule, um, there's going to be other rules. So this is a more sophisticated rule called the N the F rule for avoiding motion blurring. This takes into account a number of things. Uh, the declination, the uh, pixel uh, hit of your sensor of your imaging device, your lens focal length, and that's the effective focal length, your focal ratio, um, sort of a fudge factor, this a multiplication factor, and also um, the output of that is then your recommended shutter speed. Um, this K multiplication factor is an important consideration. Uh, the, the, the photographer who created this rule um, recommended a multiplication factor anywhere between one to three. One would give pinpoint stars, but less signal because you're shooting for less time. Whereas um, three would give you more signal, but slightly more elongated stars. Um, from what I was able to read on this, um, a lot of people tend to use uh, kind of two to two and a half as their fudge factor for this, this K value, the multiplication factor. Now this seems like a lot more to go through if you're standing at your camera trying to take a picture. Um, I, I, had, I personally do not use this rule. I tend to use the rule of 500 or 400 or 300, um, depending on where I'm shooting and, uh, and you know how much I want to ensure that there's um, pinpoint stars. Part of it depends on how dark your background sky is because that'll reduce um, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, things like sky gradients things of that sort. So there's a lot of factors that you're gonna kind of keep in your head. So having a complicated equation for me doesn't, doesn't sit well. Fortunately with iPhones and everything else that you have at your fingertips now, um, there are apps. Uh, this is one that I particularly like. Uh, this is called PhotoPills. And I, I don't use it for this purpose, but I use it for determining where the sun's going to rise, where the moon's going to rise, where the moon's going to set. It's, a, it's an excellent app. They have um, meteor shower information, where, um, where the Milky Way is, where the Milky Way is rising, when, and you can set a location, you can set a time of day, you can store that as a planning thing. I'm not trying to do an advertisement for photo bills, but this is a really handy utility. If, if you guys, if any if anyone on this call has, um, uh, you know, is looking at the email group that uh, Andrew Hitchner had posted a picture up at um, uh, Eagles Mirror with the um, Milky Way and the nighttime stars reflecting on Eagles Mirror Lake. He did that planning through photo pills. Um, there was another shot that Andrew posted a while ago where um, there was a pier going out into the water with some beautiful starscape behind it. Uh, that was done, that was planned using photo films. So it's, it's very, that's, that's how I tend to use it, not with the, um, the, uh, um, the MPF rule. But if you want to do the MPF rule, you can plug in your data and then this will calculate it directly. And they, this, and you notice up top here, it says spot stars. That's equivalent to like an N equals one. They don't have a number or a K factor. They just have it like uh, spot stars, uh, slightly elongated more along eight, and I think it puts in the values one, two, and three into the software. <clears throat> um, this is a shot of um, uh, the strawberry moon on the summer solstice, and uh, this is a fixed tripod, and, and here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm shooting at a longer shutter speed, 1 80th of a second with a 300 millimeter lens. Even though that lens is image stabilized, um, it's just a more comfortable feeling. You, you, you know you're going to get a sharp image uh, in, this, in, you know, in this particular case. Um, and this is way faster than the rule of 500. I, I could have gone you know, um, a little over a second with this, but the moon's still really bright, so there was no need to. I, I, I shouldn't say, I'm sorry, this is 400 millimeter equivalent, so I could have gone about a second. Um, this one was just serendipity. I, um, was up at Cherry Springs and I was setting up 
uh, a camera on a tracker to do some wide field stuff of the summer Milky Way in Sagittarius. And um, I, I happened to um, look over and I saw the crescent moon. This is the young moon setting and it was starting to go through the trees. So I quickly took the camera off the tracker, stuck it off, stuck it, just pulled the tracker off, put it on the tripod and then um, happened to catch it just as it was coming through this little notch in the, in the trees. This is a four second exposure. This was fairly dark. And um, uh, this was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this was uh, a little bit out, out or a little bit outside of the rule of 500 because it's a 160 millimeter equivalent, but it's still relatively sharp at that focal length. Now here's, here's an example of um, shooting through an obstruction. Uh, this was a super moon and, I, and I, I wanted to go out. There's this horse farm there where I live and I went out on, um, uh, on the road where I had a good uh, view of the eastern horizon. So I was watching the moon come up and there, was, there were a lot of clouds. There were a lot of clouds in the, in the, uh, in, in the sky. And this was a good example. I put this in here to show you um, how the dynamic range of an image is a big factor as you're photographing. So the dynamic range is really the ratio between the brightest and the darkest parts of the um, of the uh, subject. So um, some cameras nowadays have what's called a high dynamic range mode. They'll actually sit there and they'll you can put your camera on the tripod. You can say I want to bracket you know, one one stop or two stops plus or minus, or just let it figure it out. There's even an auto mode on cameras and it'll it'll actually create a composite image. Well, I tend to still do things more the old old school way. And I, I took a series of photographs to create a composite image to create effectively a high dynamic range image. But I wanted to show you what it looked like um, in terms of what the camera saw, not my eye, I actually saw through those clouds, some surface detail in the moon. The camera did not have the dynamic range to catch that though. This is a four second exposure with a hundred millimeter lens. This is a full frame camera. So there's no crop factor. It's not effectively 160, it is hundred millimeter. So I'm gonna show you, I took that same lens, same settings and just dialed that zoom lens up to 400 millimeters. So same f-stop, same, same exposure time, same camera, same ISO. So this is what that lens is seeing if you were to zoom in to that central part of the picture with the moon. And then I brought it down a stop, or, or I shouldn't say a stop, I half the shutter speed. Um, I effectively half the exposure, half the exposure again, that's one second, half the exposure again, that's half second exposure, quarter second exposure, eighth second exposure. You can start to see here, you're starting to get a little bit of surface detail, a little more here, and then a noticeable amount of surface detail here. This 15th of a second is about what I saw with my eye. And I use my eye as kind of the, the gold standard. Um, not saying I have good eyes, but just saying that that's my, the only tool that I have. And then I created a composite by combining all of these photographs. I created a composite that looked about what my eye saw. And you could argue maybe the background was a little bit brighter, maybe the surface detail was a little bit less, but it's all within, you know, um, margin of error for creating something that that was about what I saw when I looked through uh, binoculars at this object. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say naked. I had a, a pair of uh, image stabilized binoculars with me and I was, I was looking at it that way too. So from a um, standpoint, this is, this is done as, uh, as a weighted average. Um, so all, all the layers were pulled into Photoshop and then they were averaged down um, to create that, that image. And um, that's about what my eyes saw through the binoculars. So techniques like that, even with clouds, it doesn't have to ruin your night or ruin your, your outing. It can create a lot of visual interest and create a really cool scene. 
Here's another shot with some clouds, but this time they're not in front of the moon. There's, a, there's some wispy stuff sitting right above the moon. This is the single exposure. Fifteenth of a second. This is a, a different night, obviously. This was um, years years earlier. This is my old uh, uh, digital rebel. It's the crop sensor. So 300 millimeter equivalent, fixed tripod, one fifteenth of a second exposure, no compositing. It's just a straight shot out of the camera because those clouds were not thick and they weren't in front of the moon. So the dynamic range was not affected by all that blooming from the moonlight backlighting those clouds. Here's a shot that was a um, uh, half second exposure shot with um, a, a 29 millimeter lens. This was the point and shoot camera. Uh, this was after a night of observing at Cherry, Cherry Springs. Mike Atwell and I were up there and um, it was, this was done at like six six in the morning. He he went in the tent to crash, and I saw that the moon was coming up, and I knew that it would be a particularly young moon. A actually, I shouldn't say young moon. This is the old moon in the new moon arms. So this is a new moon. Uh, I shouldn't say a new moon. It's an old moon um, getting ready to uh, set, actually. And um, I ran across to the airplane field and put my camera on the tripod and took this exposure. And there's mercury sitting up here. In fact, I, I, if I go to the next thought slide, I annotated it. So there's mercury sitting up here and there's this 28.4 day old moon, 1.4% uh, illuminated. Um, and moon cycle is, is around 29 and a half. I think it's 29.53 days. So this is pretty close to, um, to the end of the lunar cycle. And this is one of my favorite shots. I have this, the, the uh, trees in the foreground. There was a little tree and I purposely did that to, to create framing for that. The angle of the trees kind of matches the angle of the planets. So I sat there, it was, there was dew everywhere. My feet were sopping wet and I kind of sat on the ground and my pants got sopping wet and I had the tripod real low and I just played with that composition and then took a series of exposures and this was the best one. Um, another thing in terms of uh, astronomical phenomena are the northern lights. Now, they don't happen that often around here, but they do happen. This one, I was happened to be taking out the trash late one night, and I looked over, and I happened to see this glow in the sky. So I ran in, grabbed my camera and tripod, and I took a 30-second exposure. Now, the reason why you don't have to worry about star trailing in this is because you're not worried about star trailing in it. You're not trying to take a picture of the star. You're trying to take a long exposure of that uh, of that atmosphere of that uh, phenomenon of the northern lights, so that you um, uh, can kind of get that color saturation, and you can integrate sort of the movement of the northern lights. These stars are trail, but I don't, I don't really care. I'm not really looking at that. I'm looking at that color behind those trees. If it if it were a windy day, these trees would be blurred because they'd be blown by the wind, but it happened to be a particularly still night, so the trees are nice and crisp, even in 30 second exposure. This is looking north northwest, and a, a little bit earlier in the night, um, about a half hour earlier, this was in the north northeast, this was the color, and this is just in my backyard. So it was a beautiful night, I must have 50 shots of this, it was just, everywhere you looked, it was a different color, there was purple, there was white, coming out of the top, you know, like more like from the zenith, and it was just gorgeous. The key here is to shoot wide field and to shoot long. I think typically when I do auroras, the minimum I'll shoot is about 15 second exposures, somewhere between 15 and 30 second exposures. Um, and Tom, you want to take this? Okay, this is where I take over then. <laughs> okay, uh, just to... Uh... Kind of get things started here with this. Uh, if you notice the camera I'm using, it's a Canon 3Ti. It's the low end of the DSLRs, and it's several years old now. And uh, and the tripod I use is a very lightweight tripod that I've had probably weighs five pounds. Maybe I've had it for over 40 years. Uh, as a result, I have to be careful, like Gary was saying, because it's a lightweight tripod. I have to use the 
the mitigation techniques, such as using a, a 10 second timer, or I actually have a, uh, a wireless cable uh, release type of thing that I can, this little small infrared device, probably an inch or two, you know, long and maybe an inch wide. And you can just aim it at the camera and it will fire the shutter. And uh, so I, I use things like that. And also I'm using a telephoto lens uh, oftentimes on the Canon and probably most DSLRs, you can do a, a mirror lock. One of, one of the options in the menu, buried in the menus, you go in there and you can lock the mirror up. So when you push the shutter, the mirror doesn't, you don't, you don't have that mirror slap followed by the shutter opening. So the mirror, the first time you hit the, hit the shutter, really, the mirror flaps up and then you hit it again and your picture is taken. So it's another way of, of mitigating some vibration. So anyway, that's just some... Uh, some some tips and also uh even though it's an old camera and these all the images i'm going to show here uh, are all taken with the kit lens that came with the canon rebel the the 3ti like i said it's just a it's the quality of the lens is good the, the lens is slow i have a telephoto that i bought that came with it basically and an 18 to 55 the telephoto is a 75 to 300 and uh the lens quality is good but it's good because they haven't stopped down pretty far <laughs> so they can get away with it. I mean, the fastest I can shoot uh, typically is about F4.5 to F5.6, depending on the, the, uh, the range I am in focal length. But you can still do an awful lot with that. And anyway, this is a shot up at, up at Cherry Springs. It's the Northern Lights again, and uh, just happened to be up there. And one thing you'll notice between the backyard – of Gary's house in Cherry Springs, there's a lot more stars when you go to Cherry Springs, which is a real advantage when you're doing, when you're doing especially single shot photography on a tripod. If you can get the darker sight you get to, the, the more fun results you'll have. You'll be more happy with the results. Anyway, this is just a shot of an Aurora. And I'm just gonna show you a series of pictures that are kind of things or targets that you could, that you could try. So you can go ahead, Gary. Gary's kind of being a well, driver. That's what it's <laughs> I was uh, ready to take a nap. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, <really? laughs> okay, this is uh, you could do you could do media photography too. Now, media photography um, it takes probably more luck than any other photography you'll try in astronomy because uh, meteors come and they come in like short packets. Usually, you'll get two or three in a minute. Then nothing will happen for maybe ten minutes or twenty minutes, even during a shower. Uh, your camera has to be aimed at the right spot at the right time. Uh, you can often be taking these 30-second uh, exposures in one area of the sky, and you just go, and it just finishes up, and you're ready to start the next one, and the meteor goes right through the field of view where you were aiming, <laughs> and you missed it. And, uh, but it's very tricky, but it's, it's really neat when you do capture one. This is one. This is, this, is, this is actually not my picture. This is Leon Rosen. Got this back in December at the Gemini uh, meteor shower. And uh, it's a nice example. And actually Joe helped him process this because um, he was shooting from a, a pretty, bright, pretty, pretty bright sky. So Joe Liam helped him uh, stretch it a bit and, and polish up a bit, but it's a real nice shot of a meteor. But it's one another target you can have uh, with this. Okay, earth shine. Um, I really like, I really like the earth shine. I really like looking at the, at the lit up portion of the moon from the Earth's, from the Earth's light. Uh, and you can see like on the, on the left horn there, there's a little bright spot that's kind of detached. You get to see that when it's really thin, you get those mountain peaks popping up. And uh, it's, it's a fun target, like, 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 like in Gary's shots. I mean, it's, it looks, just looks cool. And it's, you can get these, it's good from anywhere from like a, a day old to about three days old is the prime range because you get a lot of, it's really get a nice, uh, the, the moon isn't too so washed out it it brightens the whole sky up and washes it and you get the uh, you can get a nice a nice uh, earth earthlit portion and here's here's you can you can do these planetary conjunctions now I have a few different combinations here this shows Mars is the red kind of in dead center and Venus is right below it and then you have the moon so it's it's a it's a triple conjunction there and these are happening quite a bit so this is something that's a real good target for a camera and fixed tripod because, you know, me the meteor showers, they're only, you know, now and then you have to be at a dark site to really take advantage. Uh, with auroras down here, it's tough. There's not very many. 
Um, but these planetary conjunctions happen you know, a bunch of times a year. There's different combinations, maybe just two planets. Maybe you get the planets and the moon like this, but they make really nice targets. Here's another, it's another triple one. This is uh, Jupiter, Mercury, and Saturn. I have them labeled there. Saturn's little, is the faintest one off to the right there, just above Saturn, the word Saturn. And uh, this is taken right after sunset. And now I have all this, all they would mention, all this exposure data is at the bottom, right? Half a second, f four, five, and what lens I use in the ISO. The things with, the thing with these, uh, these planetary conjunctions, um, if they involve Venus or, or, or Mercury or, or a thin moon, they're going to be happen. They're going to occur early in the morning, right before sunrise or right after sunset at night. And lighting conditions are changing rapidly at that time. So I, just like Gary kept saying, like, you know, film, you know, film, the film is cheap because it's all digital. And when you go out there, just, just take your best guess at an exposure and then just keep hammering away. And you can, you can take these shots. You take on this shot. This is a, a half a second. You can you can flip through these real fast until you get the brightness right, where it's not too washed out or it's not too dark where you can't see anything. So it's real easy to do this. And so there's like a this is a real trial. It's a real trial and error thing, but it happens really quickly. So you can you you, you can go from being way off to having the right exposure in about a minute is all it takes. And it's, and it's, and you can kind of look at it and you can kind of judge how much orange you want. For example, you could take a, a shorter exposure, half a second here, and Saturn would be a hair, a hair thinner, but you may, maybe get a little more orange, which might be more pleasing to you. It's kind of a personal thing. Anyway, uh, another combination, this is early in the morning last, I guess it's, it's June of 2020 or May of 2020. Those, uh, those two months there were in the morning, very early morning before sunrise, you had a, you had a nice lineup of Jupiter in the upper right, followed by Saturn heading towards the moon. There, the moon is that washed out thing, <laughs> and way off to the left there, in the same sort of line, the brightest star on the left is Mars, right there. Now you got it, Gary. And uh, and I like this shot, uh, not because the planets are particularly. If they were by themselves, it, it wouldn't be much of a picture. But I like it because I was I, I traveled to a school that had really good horizons, it's a mile or two from my house. And it's very quiet because it's like five in the morning, and uh, I like the lights on these on these buildings. I normally would 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 hate those lights. So when I was trying to find a comet one time from Very Good Horizon, the lights stink. But on things like this, it adds it adds some balance to the whole picture and kind of frames it. I think you can photograph the brighter the the asteroids, the, the brighter ones like Vesta and Ceres and uh, Pallas and a bunch of them down to seventh or eighth magnitude. This is, now Vesta's pretty bright, probably around sixth magnitude here. But this is just a series of pictures done on the first, second, and third of March last year, just about a year ago. And uh, I, I went out there to, to find it, because usually finding a minor planet can be a real hassle if it's in like the Milky Way or something. This is Sagittarius, Milky Way. There are a gazillion stars that are like fifth to seventh magnitude, and it's hard to pick it out. But this was beautiful last year because it was in the tail of Leo. And there was almost, he had, he had a few nice bright stars to kind of anchor, to, to find out exactly where Leo's tail is. It's very bright. And the rest of the stars around there, there was only a couple six magnitude stars and the rest were quite a bit fainter. So I knew it'd be easy to pick up. So I just put the camera out. Now, um, to do a sequence here, you want to try to get the stars. If you have a grid on your a, a grid display that you can put on your DSLR in a, in a live view mode. Um, so you can kind of line the stars up roughly in the same position each night. That'll get you pretty close to what you want to do when you make your GIF. I fine tuned it in uh, Lightroom a little bit. I'm doing the same thing. I put a grid on and just fine tuned it. But, but you can see this is just a simple, inexpensive tripod with a low end uh, DSLR with the kit lens, and you can still get some pretty interesting results. You can do comets. Uh, here's Comet Neowise. We all saw that, uh, you know, a year ago or so, almost two years now in June or July. And uh, this is early in the morning. And it's, I took this with, a, you could take comets are, are kind of neat because they look good close up. They look good with a medium lens. This is just kind of a medium lens, 55 millimeters. Um, with comets, because in like because you're up to 55 millimeters, the, the the ISO you know is 3200. You want to be in that 3200, 6400. Cameras are pretty good 
uh, the CMOS cameras with the, the ISO not causing too much noise at, at, a, at a high level. So you can uh, you can jack up the the ISO so you can get you can begin to record this the fainter stars and stuff, and this is only an eight second exposure and yet you can see quite a bit of tail. This is this is more of a close up. It's a one twenty five millimeter lens now. I just wanted to show the comet in a little more a little more of of a of a detail and see a little more in the the tail itself, make it a little bigger. But uh, it's basically. Uh, you know, so it's, it's only a four second exposure here. Uh, now, but like with, when Gary was pointing out with the, uh, with the 500 rule, and then there was the much more complicated rule, but the complicated rule takes into account the declination of the object. And Gary was showing you at, at, at the pole and even exposure, Polaris is still a pinpoint. Uh, the, the, that 500 rule is, 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 Good around the it's the four or five hundred well depending on how you want to do it how careful you are um, is really based if, if the stars are at the equator so because that is the fastest moving stars in the sky so if if you use the five hundred rule you're going to be good anywhere you point in the sky but as you go further north that rule begins to stretch a little bit so you can get a little more out of it um, and comet neowise was up at a pretty high. Uh, the declination was pretty high at that time. It was in Auriga, I think, in the constellation Auriga. So it was pretty far north, probably plus 30 or, or higher, plus 40. Anyway, it's a telephoto. But you also can go to, you can hit a Gary. And uh, you can do wide fields, though. This is a 25 mil. Now, the comet is real small off on the left. But I wondered that because Venus was off on the, on the, there's, there's the comet. Right? And Venus is over here in, in Taurus. And you can see the head of Taurus, the Hades there, that V. And right above it is the Pleiades. And I thought it looked really pretty in the sky. And the sky was just starting to brighten a bit. Now, with the naked eye, it wasn't, it wasn't as bright as this. But you could tell it was brighter than, than above it. And then the sun was, the twilight was creeping in. So the, uh, I knew if I took an exposure. And once again, I, I, you know, you take several exposures. This is because I'm at 25 millimeters. I can shoot 15 seconds now. I'm shooting longer. But I'm sure when I shot this, I shot 8 seconds. I shot 30 seconds or 25 seconds. And I got the one where it wasn't too washed out or wasn't. I wanted to get the max number of stars without washing it out. And they got some nice color in there, you know. And uh, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, go ahead, Gary. Same kind of deal here. This, this is the Big Dipper. You'll have to point that out to him, Gary. Maybe the handle's at the very top on the left-hand side of center at the top. And it goes down. And the bowl was down below. There it is, the Big Dipper. And there's the comet at the bottom. I wanted to get this. I used that to use a 20 millimeter to get to squeeze this all in. This is after sunset, a couple of days after that. Uh, the comet was in the morning sky in, in the 12th and 14th time range of July in 2020. And this was a few days later, because it was so far north, you can see it's close to the Big Dipper, that it, be, that it went, it was, for a couple of days, it was visible in the morning sky and in the evening sky. And this is now in the evening sky, when it's close to the Dipper. But, and you can see there's some clouds, and like Dyer was talking, the clouds, clouds are your friends sometimes. This is, the clouds actually add a lot here, because they add a little bit of pink color and stuff, and it gives some texture to the whole picture. Oh, this, sure is, uh, this is Comet Transcars. Oh, I'm sorry, someone saying something? Now, this is Comet Panstar shot in 2013. And I, I added this in because um, uh, in terms of fixed tripod, um, this is a one, one second exposure uh, shot through a small refractor. Um, so it's, it's an equivalent of about 500, uh, 550 millimeter focal length um, at ISO 1600. But I then took a series of exposures and then put them together into a little into a little animation. So this is a, essentially 15 minutes worth of total elapsed time um, of the comic movement in, in one outing. And you can see it was particularly windy that night. It was actually really cold. It was a really bitter, cold, windy night. As you can see those foreground trees moving back and forth in each shot. These are uh, um, 0.7 second exposures. Uh, and there's, a, I think, 112 or 114 exposures that are combined into this 50 something second animation. But it really gives you a sense of the uh, comet movement over a relatively short period of time. 
Um, this was like 14 minutes worth of the last time of, of comet movement. So Tom was saying things change fast. Well, even the, you know, the Earth rotation is very, very fast. So it's making it look like that comet's screaming across the uh, sky. Um, so it's equivalent of um, 550 in terms of 35 millimeter equivalent. This was a crop sensor. And uh, Tracy, um, my wife Tracy was uh, very good moral support and helped me carry the stuff out. To, this was shot over at Heavner, Heavner Park, over at Heavner Field, you know, right, right out near where we live and where we have some of the DVAA outings, some of the workshops that we've done for uh, telescope usage and things like that. So not a not a dark sky site, just an average site. Okay, Tom. Okay, uh, this is a shot, a fixed tripod. Now you can, if you have a tracker. Now we're going to go over trackers in the next in the next uh, next workshop. But even with a fixed tripod, this is up at Cherry Springs, uh, August of 2020, and this is uh, actually went up there, and uh, Gary and Tracy actually were up at the same time. And uh, once again, the clouds are kind of your friend. Is right on the tree line there, you see some dark clouds. And this, actually, it's funny. If you go, if you're used to your backyard and you see clouds come in, the clouds are white or bright gray. When you go somewhere really dark, the clouds are black. <laughs> you see black coming and they just block stars. It's, it's a really strange thing after being, if you're used to bright, the bright clouds at nighttime for years when you go there, it's, it's really, it's really strange. But this is just a, uh, now I, I, want, I want wide angle, 18 millimeters, so I could shoot like a 25 second exposure. And uh, it's, it's, it's always kind of neat when you're at a star party or a place where a lot of people gather, because you always have some, some, some red light in the foreground, which kind of, you know, makes it kind of neat. You got a tree line there and stuff. And Sagittarius area of the Milky Way is just brilliant all the time. And there's Jupiter and Saturn are in there too. Yeah, uh, cool. Off to the side there is Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter's the bright one. And here's and, uh, but it, uh, yeah, but this is just a single, you know, 30, 30, uh, 25 second exposure, fixed tripod, single shot. So there's a lot of things you can do, even though if that's all you have and your, and your tripod's not expensive and stuff, if you're careful, you can still get some decent shots. You can photograph uh, eclipses, lunar eclipses. This just gives you an example of just, this is the beginning of an eclipse, but I've I've done this right through the whole, the entire sequence, and it's in fact um, this time I did it because it was cold. You can see the date was January twentieth, and it was about five or six degrees outside, and there was no way I was going to get, get a scope out and get with a camera with a scope. So I got the my telephoto out, my kit telephoto at three hundred millimeters, and I just took a series of of images like this. And the next picture you'll see it. Go ahead, Gar. It's at totality. And I, 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 stopped, I went down from that 300 to like a 75 millimeter to, to uh, you can see the moon's kind of orange. Now it's, it's overexposed because I wanted to get the star cluster up on the upper left there is the beehive cluster, M44. And uh, one thing there's, if, if you're lucky, there's the, the, the beehive cluster is right along the ecliptic and so is uh, the, the, the Pleiades are pretty close. Two really bright clusters. And sometimes you can get lucky like this where the, M44 was close during totality. Actually, the eclipse we had back in was November, I think it was. Uh, it was it was at totality. It wasn't that far from the uh, Pleiades. So you can you can take advantage. You have to you know just be aware of those type of type of, of opportunities. Uh, you can you can take occultations of of bright objects. Now, if it's in the daytime, your only object you're going to get is Venus probably because you can see it's the moon's pretty washed out because it's thin, but you can see Venus. And you can see the moon creeping up on it in each frame there. And you can see it till eventually the last frame, it's gone. But, uh, but if, it was, if this was at nighttime, you can, like Venus is really bright, so you can do it in the daytime or at nighttime. But you could do this with occultations of you know, the, the, the other planets or, or, or bright stars. And it's just something you can do with just a simple camera and a fixed tripod. Solar eclipses. Now, before I start, anything, solar eclipses, just in general, we all know this, but with the sun, you got to be careful. I mean, you, you got to watch your eyes, of course, but you got to watch your camera lens, too, because if you have to watch, it'll burn it out. Now, this was a sunrise eclipse. This happened last June, and it was June 10th. It was an annular eclipse across part of the world, and for us, it was a 
fairly deep partial eclipse. It was about a 90%, I think, or I forget the number, maybe 92 even. And this is from uh, New Jersey on the, on the shore. Of this is in uh, Belmar. And I went down there early in the morning. It was all dark. And uh, the clouds, I was worried about the clouds. But then the clouds at the close to the horizon cleared enough, which is what I wanted, because the clouds above it add some <laughs> adds, add a bit of interest here. If it was just if it was all just pink, it wouldn't be the be as interesting. But when this rose, just those two tips on the on came above the horizon, which is what I wanted to see. I actually just dying to see that, just to see two points come up as a sunrise, and. Uh, so this, this, there was, I didn't use any, any filter here because the sun is so dim at that point because uh, of, the, the, of the cloud haze and stuff. I didn't have to use a filter. This is a little bit later. Now you can see the sun's getting up a little higher. It's getting into little thinner clouds and plus less is covered. So you have to, you know, you, 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 you take your image and you move the camera out of the way. And once again, light, lighting conditions are changing quickly, very quickly. So you're flipping that that exposure, you know, left and right. You know, you're going from a hundredth to a to a five hundredth to maybe a slower ISO. But um, anyway, and then I have a little GIF sunrise here, and you can see the two points come up. And then, and this is once again just fixed tripod. I kept the tripod and the camera in the same spot, and I just click the click the shutter every so many seconds, basically. Uh, I guess the sun, the sky moves about four degrees. I'm sorry, four minutes for one degree. This is about, so the sun's about a half a degree. So that's two, that takes two minutes. So this is probably like covering maybe a minute and a half or two minute time frame. this whole elapsed time. But it was really, it was really impressive to see. And, uh, but these are the kind of things you, you can do with just a tripod. You can do you can do solar eclipses. Now the cool, I mean, a total solar eclipse. Now the good thing about a total solar eclipse, which is really nice, there is no wrong exposure. It's unbelievable. The range, the dynamic range of a solar eclipse is through the roof. I mean, if all you want to get is the bright prominences right up against the sun, maybe you're shooting at two thousandth of a second, and if you want to get the outer corona, maybe you're shooting at two seconds. I mean, and anything in that range will get you something. Now, if you wanted to get the if you wanted to get the prominences and you shot a second, well, you're not going to get them. You know, so you have to think about before time, but you're not going to walk away empty-handed in a total solar eclipse. And these things, uh, if you have never traveled to one or thought oh, that's that seems like a lot of work, it's not worth it. Um, a total solar eclipse is not just something you see; you kind of experience it. It's it's unbelievable. Um, there was a whole group. A group of us went out to to Casper, Wyoming, the last eclipse in 17. A bunch of, bunch of people from the club went down to Mississippi or South Carolina or Illinois or Indiana. And, and uh, it's, it's a phenomenal thing to see. But this was actually a movie. For this eclipse, I decided not to, I'd seen a couple before, years and years ago. And I decided that I didn't want to spend time at the camera fooling with the camera. And they have software programs. You can run off your laptop and it'll fire off a preset a series of exposures, if you want, and just wire the, your laptop right to the camera. But I don't want to bring. I don't want to bring too much gear, so I just have my 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 small lightweight tripod, and I put my my uh, my camera, and I shot a movie because I thought I, I always liked Eclipse movies, and I just put the camera into auto mode. I did some tests in my basement with different lighting conditions and how fast the camera would recover from a real bright light to a dim light. And decided it was worth a try, so I set it up, and I sized the uh, the telephoto and the framing such that it would drift, but it wouldn't wouldn't leave the field. I started in the left hand lower left hand corner and went up towards the upper right hand corner of the frame. So I shot this movie, and from the movie, I could slice and dice. I sliced like a three second piece or a couple second piece from the from the uh, from the the diamond diamond ring on both ends, and maybe a five second piece from the middle. And uh, each of those slices consist of, you know, like in the write-up I have, I have like, it's, it's like 80 frames were shot in, in for that, that made those end pieces and maybe 150 frames were, were stacked for that middle shot. But then you can process it like you're processing 
a lunar photograph, a planetary photograph, you know, a solar, normal solar photograph, which we'll talk about, you know, in, in future workshops, doing all those kind of things, but which allow you to, to, stack, to stack those individual frames and to sharpen those individual frames. And you can get the, the detail is half decent for being just a camera, just sitting on a tripod, doing its thing in auto. <laughs> okay, Gary. It's just a close up of the same thing, but you can see the coronal brushes coming out and that little dot on the little right, the white dot on the lower left there is Regulus, the star Regulus. It was very close to the eclipse sun. Okay. And uh, I think that's it. I think you're. Yeah. I think, and then, um, so, the, so then to take it another step, if you added uh, an inexpensive accessory like an intervalometer, um, you can even expand the type of um, shots you can you can do further. So an intervalometer is basically a um, it's kind of like a cable release that has a timer built in. So it allows you to um, to program a delay. It allows you to program uh, the um, interval between pictures, and it allows you to program how many seconds an exposure should go for if you're running your camera, say, in bulb mode, where you're going to externally control how long that shutter is open for, and then how many exposures. Or if you set the number to zero, it'll just keep shooting until you turn it off. So this is the one that I have for my, um, for my camera. And I also have uh, an aftermarket one that I bought, um, which was, you know, was like a fraction of the cost. So I, I and it works just as well. In fact, it's even a little easier to use in some ways. So um, um, don't be discouraged if, if you know if you um, if you're looking at one and there's aftermarket one. That they, from what I've heard, I, I know other people that have them too. They work they work fine. And it also has an added bonus that it even has the shutter release. If you want to manually control your camera, you can see the button in the center is your shutter release, and you can lock that down just like a regular shutter release. Just to, um, just, I'm going to jump release. in here for one second, Gary. I just yeah. bought that same one you have on the right, the aftermarket one, and they're really inexpensive. You're talking like $19. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like a major investment. Even if you, even if you only use it now and then, it's, it's, right. a, it's a nice little tool. And, and I think when I bought this Canon one, they, it was before the aftermarket ones came out. This is, you know, you know 20 years old. I think it was like 150 or something. And then the second one that I bought was like $20 and they both, in fact, when I went to Arizona, I took the, the, the $20 one, because like I said, it's actually a little easier to, to set up. Um, so um, by adding a cable release, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not to say by adding an intervalometer, you can do some cool things with a fixed tripod, like take a series of photographs. These were shot every four minutes, except for that first one. I was playing around with the uh, time and, Maybe at some point I'll I'll lock that off, off the picture. But um, these were shot at four minute intervals of a setting lunar eclipse. This was shot over uh, right near Heber Heber Park again. Um, this was back in 2007. I did have to change the exposure time as that moon got lower and lower because it's getting darker because it's getting more covered and it's also going into some some low clouds here and so the atmosphere is getting thicker as it's going down. Um, not just because we're looking further into the distance, it's because there's stuff in the air. So um, that four minutes winds up being a good time for me to experiment in terms of how much is that exposure changing. So I'm, I'm, I'm shooting some manual shots in between, adjusting my exposure so that it looks consistent going down, like looks like it does to your eye. Um, this is a, a shot of um, a, a lunar eclipse, and if I had a longer frame, I have the, the, the outbound side of it too. If I could, you know, or I shrunk it down more and add more, more images. But um, uh, this is with a fixed tripod. I, I wound up moving the tripod afterwards to get the rest of it. So as far as a fixed tripod, this was all fixed. This is actually Saturn running alongside this uh, the the moon it happened to be right next to Saturn I forget what that star was that was um, a bright star but this little dot is actually Saturn so these were done four minutes between exposures and anywhere from a sixth of a second to 1.6 seconds in the middle I'm shooting fairly fairly uh, 
you know, a short focal length, so 80 millimeter focal length. And this is with an old, this is with an old camera. This is um, my old Canon Rebel uh, 300D. So this was, I think you can probably buy these for $10 or something if you, if you found one on, e on eBay or something, because people would probably give it away. Um, this camera has a particularly really good red response. So I actually use this for deep sky stuff when I'm shooting prime focus, which we'll talk about in a future workshop. But um, it has a really good red response, even though it's an unmodified camera. Um, this is a picture that I showed earlier, but I'm going to show you a couple of these. So this is um, shot over at, a, at Len, Len Jensen's um, uh, cabin one time. We had a little outing out there with, with a bunch of us. And uh, I was we were doing visual observing. I had a visual telescope, and I also just set up my camera on a tripod because I wanted to see what it was like to take some uh, star trails. So this was an eight minute exposure shot uh, with the 50D at ISO 400, uh, very wide angle, so 16 millimeter equivalent. So here's another, that's the next one in the sequence and, and another one, and, and there were more. And then I combined them, there's free freeware you can download that just combines the brightest part of each image. And since it's a fixed tripod, you don't have to align it, you just, because it's the tripod's not moving. So Polaris is, is here. You can see Polaris there, and they always say it's not really at the pole. Well, here's proof that it's not really at the pole because it has a little trail, and you can see that the center, the uh, sort of concentric part of this set of rings is a little bit um, to the upper left of where Polaris is in this image. And then I always like when I'm looking at these is to say, well, what are the constellations in there? So I went on the SkyMap Pro, and I put in the same time and data and I, I scaled it and then overlaid it on top of that image in uh, Photoshop. So here you can see the Big Dipper, um, Cassiopeia, uh, uh, Dracus, and, and so forth. And then, oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. So I'll go back and forth between the, the scale a little bit differently, but you get the idea. So, um, that's it as far as this presentation goes. But as a teaser, um, we're going to be taking these topics further. So stay tuned. So next, what we want to talk about is using a camera on a tracking device, such as an Ioptron Sky Guider or equivalent, or even a German equatorial mount um, with like a ball head or something. So you can point the camera wherever you want. Um, there's also a very simple technique of using a focal photography where you can just put the camera up to the eyepiece and you've kind of focused the camera at infinity if it has a manual focus or even autofocus tends to work and and that um the light coming out at the at the plane of the eyepiece is really uh parallel because you're close to the um uh to the field stop and then it winds up basically being in focus with the camera that you're holding up the eyepiece and they sell little holders for your iPhone to do this, and little holders for a camera that you can clamp onto your eyepiece and then mount the camera to that. And then lastly, like a prime focus astrophotography using a DSLR or a dedicated camera. So we do plan a series of workshops, and, and we'd like other people to contribute as well, obviously, because this the whole point of this club of this um, astroimaging group is to try to um, share knowledge and for all of us to learn collectively from one another. So if you look at something like um, the uh, tracker, and Joe, I um, stole this from your deck next, for next month, just to give an example, this is a, a part of Joe's setup with his um, Ioptron Sky Guider Pro. Um, this is what I've done in the past. I, I have one of the trackers also that I've used, but I even before I bought a tracker, I just took my mount and I just done um, took a little duck, ducktail plate, uh, screwed a ball head to it, and I just stuck my camera on that. So these are equivalent in terms of um, the end result. The nice thing about a, uh, something like this is it's incredibly compact. So like when I went out to Wyoming for the solar eclipse with, with, with Tom and the guys um, and, and, the, and the other people, um, I actually just brought the previous version, which is called the Ioptron Sky Tracker. And I just mounted a ball head on that with my camera and my telephoto lens on a small tripod. So we'll talk about those kind of things next month to make it 
take it further because now you can really have long exposures. Um, a focal photography, this is a picture from a presentation I did for the club back in 2000 or something like that, 2001, uh, for the Mercury, actually it was 1999, it was the Mercury Transit over at Valley Forge Park. And um, this is putting a camera, point and shoot camera right on an eyepiece and taking pictures. And you, you'd be surprised at the results you can get. It's, I mean, they're impressively good. And then lastly, we can, we'll talk about and other people will contribute with prime, prime focus. And with prime focus, you're taking your, your, your uh, camera and you're attaching it right to the telescope as you would an eyepiece. Here's a wide field setup with a guide scope. And here's more of a narrow field setup. This is a, a longer focal length telescope with a guide scope and, um, and the camera, both mounted on German equatorial mount. So stay tuned for future talks.